Hello everyone and welcome to Who's the Hoodlum? We're having some fun with this little game of ours so far and we hope you are too. There were some interesting guests on our mystery hoodlum number two. Jason Farmer and Tracy Tobin guest Ron Caribia. Patrick Murphy guest Big Billy D'Elia. Dibs G said totally clueless but loved the polka dotted shirt. And Brett Gibson said Charlie off the wall ding dong. I saw that name in a book once and always wanted a reason to reference it somehow. Done. Kind of funny. But nope, none of these are right. So who is the hoodlum with the polka dotted shirt? This hoodlum's name is James Big Jim Capitordo. And boy, does this guy have a story. You're going to love this one. James Big Jim Capitordo was born in 1942 in Cleveland, Ohio. He was a high school dropout, though alleged to be a football star and Golden Glove boxer. Big Jim was one of two adopted children in a household of 52 others his parents had fostered over the years. Yes, 52, 5 two. The family didn't have 54 living in the house all at once, but according to an interview Capitordo's mother gave to the Fort Lauderdale News, they usually had six children under their roof at any given time including Big Jim and his adopted sister. She told the newspaper that over a period of 20 years, she washed over 20,000 diapers and did some 3,000 loads of laundry a month. Can you imagine? The newspaper had contacted her after Big Jim got into trouble in Florida in January 1962. He was arrested after being caught using a credit card he had stolen from a businessman in Cleveland. The store manager reported him because he thought there was something odd about this huge guy from Cleveland buying so many tires and so much gasoline. He had also by this time been arrested and charged with resisting an officer, three counts of disorderly conduct, interstate transportation of a stolen vehicle, and a federal charge of interstate transportation of stolen property, the stolen credit card. By 1964, he had two more federal charges of transportation of forged securities. This high school dropout had definitely gone astray. Capitorta moved to Pompano Beach, Florida with his parents in 1960 after they retired. He was 20 years old at the time. After arriving in the Sunshine State, he took a job as a truck driver, but also operated an auto body repair shop, which authorities believed was a front for a stolen car racket. Big Jim also had a side job as a bouncer for a local club called the Four O'Clock Club located in Hollywood, Florida. Not to be confused with the five o'clock club Frank Dio owned in Miami Beach. Although he fancied himself a mobster, traveled in some of the same circles, and was even described by police as a mafia enforcer, Big Jim was nothing more than a cowboy and a bully, a mobster wannabe who racked up a lengthy police record over his lifetime, both on the local and federal levels. So pull up a chair, because you're about to learn what kind of whacked out life Big Jim lived and why he lived up to his nickname, all six foot five and 305 pounds of him. He was a guy you most definitely couldn't miss. Like in August 1966, when an astute cop stopped Big Jim for a traffic violation. He remembered seeing Big Jim in court earlier that week for another traffic violation, no less. Capitordo had told the court he couldn't surrender his license because he didn't have one, since he already gave it to the Florida Highway Patrol at the time of that previous traffic violation. But when this cop asked for a license, Big Jim, being the smart guy he was, handed over the license he told the court he didn't have. He was immediately arrested and charged with contempt of court. He pleaded innocent, was released on $1,000 bond, and later got probation. In April 1967, Big Jim was one of three people busted for a counterfeit ring operating out of Broward Dade in South Palm Beach counties. Arrested along with him was Barbette Bookout and Mary Miller, a go-go dancer. Barbette ended up getting hitched to Big Jim a bit later. Capitordo had already been arrested a few days before when he was trying to make a bet at Gulfstream Racetrack using fake $20 bills. He pleaded guilty. He was later sentenced to five years in federal prison after the go-go dancer turned state's witness. In that same month, he was charged with assault to commit first-degree murder after viciously beating a bartender with a tire iron at a hotel bar. Among the three other men charged with him was Joseph Camperlengo, the owner of the Four O'Clock Club where Big Jim worked as a bouncer. 
The funny thing about this is that the sheriff's departments knew beforehand that four men were going to assault someone at the Ocean View Hotel. So they camped out and watched as four men entered the bar and four men left the bar after the bartender already got his beating. Big Jim and the others were picked up as they drove away. They were all charged with aggravated assault and released on $3,000 bond. Camper Lenga was also charged with permitting a felon to work at the club. He claimed he didn't know Big Jim was a felon. As it turned out, the bartender disappeared. Since the case couldn't be proven without the victim's testimony, all the defendants agreed to plead guilty to rid the court of the case. Big Jim got two years probation. A few weeks after the bartender beating in that same month of April 1967, Big Jim was charged with procuring prostitution at the 4 o'clock club. While he was free on bond for both those charges, he was picked up by the U.S. Marshal's Office for violating parole from two federal convictions he got back in 1963 and 1964 for transporting forged securities. So, by the time the prostitution trial started that November, he was already sitting in jail. During the trial, the star witness, a 23-year-old woman, said that Big Jim offered to set her up with customers and he would do it for 30% of her proceeds. He told her he had many other women working for him. Unfortunately for Big Jim, this woman happened to be a state beverage agent making a routine check for beverage violations. His lawyers claimed that because she failed to arrest Big Jim at the time of the proposition, her testimony was invalid. But the witness said she was afraid of the big burly bouncer who approached her. Big Jim took the stand on his behalf and testified that he only promised her the job because he wanted to have an affair with her. The jury didn't buy it. They deliberated for only 40 minutes and found him guilty. His estranged wife, Barbette, they had only been married a few months, was at court that day to support her husband, but she was sitting outside the courtroom while all the drama was happening inside, reading Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra. When the judge sentenced Big Jim to six months in prison, she had apparently made her way back into the courtroom and cried out when her Antony was led away in cuffs. As a side note, Burbett, a former go-go dancer, had been arrested in June 1967 for receiving stolen property and a barbiturate law violation. She was trying to cash a $141 check with a male companion. In 1968, she pleaded guilty to aiding and assisting the armed robbery of a Fort Lauderdale restaurant. The take was $2,800. By 1971, Big Jim had stepped up his criminal activities a notch or two by trafficking in cocaine. He was also extorting debtors who were in default of loan shark loans. By 1974, he was running with the big boys. In June of that year, he was arrested as part of a massive cocaine distribution conspiracy operating between New York and Florida. Thirty defendants were arrested in both states. Two of those arrested were alleged associates of the Genovese and Gambino crime families. Another was a loan agent for a Miami savings and loans company. Authorities reported that close to $800,000 had been embezzled to fund the narcotics ring. Even Big Jim's old friend, Joseph Camperlengo, from his four o'clock club days was indicted in this sting. They were all charged with transporting 26 pounds of cocaine from Florida to New York, where it was packaged and then sold on the streets. The wholesale value of the drugs was $250,000, with an estimated street value of $2.1 million. In August 1974, Big Jim was arrested by the DEA for conspiracy to sell 10 pounds of cocaine. He was acquitted in December because no drugs were seized. In May 1975, Capitorta was convicted in New York for the New York to Florida cocaine ring conspiracy and sentenced to seven years in federal prison. But he was free on bond pending appeal and was allowed to return to Florida. In June, Big Jim was accused of kidnapping with the intent to murder a local Fort Lauderdale police undercover drug agent named John Stanton. Stanton claimed that Capitorto contacted him for a drug buy and wanted to take him for a ride. For some odd reason, Stanton brought along his brother. Big Jim threatened to execute them both, but they were somehow able to talk their way out of the abduction, got dropped off, and later filed a report. 
an arrest warrant was issued soon after. A few days later, Big Jim was arrested in Pompano Beach after a traffic stop. Along for the ride just happened to be undercover agent John Stanton, the guy Big Jim was accused of trying to kidnap and kill, and a news photographer from the local paper. Big Jim, who was driving a customized burgundy Cadillac, started yelling and swearing at the officers, and he threatened to break the photographer's camera over the photographer's head. When they inspected his trunk, they found a blood-covered axe, a blood-stained bat, and a nightstick. John Stanton picked up the bat, turned to the photographer, and said, Now, you know that guy doesn't play baseball or coach Little League. They also found a marijuana roach and cocaine residue in a keychain inscribed with Too Big Jimmy from Big Benny, 5875. But none of this phased Big Jim. On the way to the courthouse, he asked the cops, What's the bail? $10,000? I can make that in an hour. He had $600 on him at the time. Big Jim immediately returned to New York after being charged and released on $50,000 bond for these new charges. While he was in court facing the New York judge, officers from Pompano Beach Organized Crime Bureau were in attendance to watch the show. As he was led away in cuffs to begin serving his seven-year term at Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, he told the cops, Ha! Huh, if it wasn't for guys like me, guys like you wouldn't have nothing to do, except making up stories. In October of that year, Capitorta was released from Atlanta Federal Prison. It seems that Agent Stanton changed his story about the alleged abduction and the charges were dropped. Big Jim was once again released on bond pending appeal by the New York judge who sentenced him. Stanton had left the police department by this time, and no further explanation was given for Stanton's bogus story. In November, Big Jim filed a lawsuit against the Fort Lauderdale and Pompano Beach Police Departments claiming harassment for never-ending traffic tickets. He said the cops were making him their mark. His lawsuit claimed cops were threatening and verbally abusing him and were doing so to provoke him into a fight. The cops laughed it off, of course, telling the news they believed Capitorto was imagining a great deal when he says police have been following him. I think he might be trying to get sympathy from the courts to enhance his position. The idea of being part of the mob had gotten into Big Jim's head. He was starting to believe his own press. In February 1976, the Miami Organized Crime Task Force arrested and hit Big Jim with racketeering charges that included importing and possessing cocaine and the day-to-day -day operation of racketeering through use of fear, intimidation, threats, and violence. He was also charged by the FBI for operating a gangster-like racket which preyed on people dealing in or using drugs, including extortion, kidnapping, and robbery, in an effort to unlawfully obtain money. Capitorta was apparently making a habit of going after people and extorting money for illicit loans they never took out. He was also kidnapping drug dealers and holding them captive until they agreed to hand over drugs, money, or jewelry. He also, by this time, had gotten involved in the pop business. Big Jim was moving up in the world, or so he thought. But that April, Big Jim's world came crashing down. On April 2, 1976, Big Jim and two of his associates, named Wayne Bruce Neal and Robert Bobby D. Dominici, made a late-night visit to the Fort Lauderdale home of Patrick Patsy Truglia. They had come to collect a $20,000 drug debt. Big Jim demanded that Truglia give him his car and all the jewelry in the house. Truglia agreed, but his wife, Mary Lou, started screaming that they weren't about to give in to Big Jim's demands. And that's when it started to get ugly. Bobby D wasn't having any of it and started slapping her around, knocking out some of her teeth. Neil pulled a gun and fired a shot to stop the insanity. Triglia reacted and pulled a gun from a holster taped under his dining room table. He emptied 25 rounds into the three attackers. Big Jim was shot 13 times in the head, neck, and chest. The 305 pound Big Jim was still alive by the time police arrived, but died on the way to the hospital. Neald was shot seven times, and Dominici, who had just moved from New York to Florida, was shot five times. Both were dead on the scene.
Police described the scene as grisly. Big Jim was sprawled on the floor. One of the others was blown half out of a wire-back chair, his hands still gripping a gun. The third lay dead in an overstuffed chair. A thirty-eight caliber gun lay on the kitchen floor, and more guns were found throughout the house. Cobb said the house was nothing short of an arsenal. Triglia, an unemployed carpenter and drywall insulation installer, who had moved to Fort Lauderdale from New Jersey just eight years prior, was arrested and charged with murder. The shootout made headlines across the country and even into Canada. As the investigation played out, it seems Triglia had been warned the day before to pay up, but it wasn't even Triglia that owed the debt, but a friend of his named Nick Russo. Big Jim allegedly told Triglia, I got ripped off for a $125,000 drug deal by a friend of yours, and since I can't find him, you owe me. It was later learned that no one owed anybody anything. Big Jim and friends were just there to extort, much like all the other extortion Big Jim had claimed he was doing for loan sharks. After the murder, one of Triglia's neighbors told the Fort Lauderdale News that he had seen numerous psychedelic and hippie types enter the Triglia's home at odd hours of the day and night. Big Jim's funeral was held a few days later in Pompano Beach. His friends weren't too happy that news photographers had invaded their privacy. Capitotto's mother had apparently threatened to sue if any news outlets showed up. When Fort Lauderdale news photographer Bob East tried taking pictures, he was attacked by several men attending the funeral who yelled and cursed at him. One of the men even destroyed East's equipment. Other photographers weren't treated too well either. On April 16, 1976, a grand jury indicted Triglia on three counts for first-degree murder related to the April 2nd shooting. He pled not guilty and claimed self-defense. On August 9, 1976, Triglia went to trial. The prosecution claimed Triglia's actions was premeditated murder and that he had concealed weapons in his home in anticipation of an attack. But Triglia's lawyer, Charles J. Rich, was so confident with the self-defense claim that he didn't call any witnesses and left the fate of his client at the hands of the jury comprised of seven men and five women. On August 13th, both sides gave their final arguments. Rich told the jurors that Big Jim was a mafia hood, a lousy hoodlum, a death machine. They threatened to kill Triglia, to kill his wife, to kill his kids, he said. I'll tell you something, if that was my wife being slapped around, I'd have shot him too. And I wouldn't have used a 9 millimeter. I'd have used a bazooka, because he was a tremendous size. The jury began deliberating at 1 p.m. At 10.30, they informed the judge they were deadlocked, but an hour later, they had finally reached a decision. Triglia was found not guilty of the murder of Big Jim Capitorto and his two associates, Wayne Bruce Neild and Robert Bobby D. Dominici. Triglia dropped his head and wept. So did his wife, Mary Lou. He thanked the jury in a soft voice. He was a free man and later told reporters he would be leaving the area for fear of reprisals. But this story isn't quite over. In September, the man who attacked the Fort Lauderdale news photographer Bob East at Big Jim's funeral was convicted of assault and sentenced to a 15-day term. His name was Vincent Anthony Serralo. He had been on parole at the time for a federal counterfeiting conviction. In October, Triglia's wife Mary Lou OD'd on prescription drugs, but survived. Later, the Triglias did move back to New Jersey, but before they did, Triglia had asked the trial judge to return the guns police had confiscated from his home back in April. The judge refused after learning that Triglia never paid the lawyer who fought so hard in his defense. And there's one more final twist to the sordid story. On May 25, 1979, in New Jersey, the Genovese's Richie the Boot Boyardo, Andy Gerardo, and others were indicted for numerous charges, including a conspiracy to kill four men. One of these men just happened to be Patrick Patsy Truglia, the same man who was acquitted for killing Big Jim. Anthony Little Pussy Russo, also a member of that Genovese New Jersey faction, was caught on tape telling an associate he got the okay to kill Triglia from New York and Richie the Boot, 
He believed Triglia was responsible for killing an associate of his named Joseph Angelino. Little Pussy Russo was killed that April, one month before the indictment hit. Patrick Patsy Triglia lived for another day. So it turns out that Big Jim Capertorto might have been closer to the mob than we thought. And that's the end of this mystery hoodlum's strange and tragic tale. If you enjoyed this installment of Who's the Hoodlum, head on over to the NewYorkMafia.com and check out our collection of New Jersey stories and bios. And while you're there, take a look at our weekly Wise Guy vignettes, where we highlight various hoodlums from different families around the country who are virtual unknowns to the general public. It's geared specifically for our readers who like it short and sweet. But remember, at Button Guys of the New York Mafia, you can also indulge in hundreds of deep dive biographies and stories on other little known wise guys, various regimes and families around the world, opinion pieces, and more. Stories you won't find anywhere else. And we even have tales about some of the bigger name guys we are all familiar with, like Richie the Boot Boyardo and Andy Gerardo told in the way only Button Guys can tell them. You can take a free peek inside the Button Guys world in our free trial section, located via a link on our homepage at thenewyorkmafia.com. You'll find a sampling of stories you're sure to enjoy. So check it out today. Also be sure to let us know your thoughts about who's the hoodlum in the comments, and smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss our next episode. Thank you for watching. Until next time.